Hey everybody, thank you for joining episode 29 of The Green Life. Today's episode is really, really important. We're going to be speaking about thyroid health, most specifically hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. I have here an amazing guest, Amanda Hinman, who is an applied functional medicine certified and integrated nutritional health coach and who used to have Hashimoto's and healed herself. She also helped her family face incredible health crisis that doctors say she couldn't overcome, and she did it. Amanda has now specialized in helping women between the age of 40 and 60 struggling with hormonal imbalances and exhaustion so they can heal themselves and really get the energy they need for their careers and family lives. Amanda founded a functional medicine company called Hinman Holistic Health Institute and together she and her team helped hundreds of women reclaim their health from the terrors of Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, insulin resistance, anxiety, PCOS, and so much more. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining me for The Green Life today. How are you? I'm doing great, Chantel. Happy to be here with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for joining me. I mean, your expertise is great and I really love your story. And uh, to, today we're going to talk about a very important subject as well, which is Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, which I know you're very passionate about and you've been digging deep into. But before we get into that nice subject, can we just give people an introduction about you, your story, how you became a practitioner? It's really fascinating. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Happy to share. Um, I am the founder and, um, you know, just passion driver of Hinman Holistic Health. And we help support women in their 40s through 60s to absolutely take control of their health, to understand what's happening at a root cause level and to feel their best so they can have more energy, more vitality and be the best version of themselves in life and in all areas, family, career, all of that fun stuff. But um, I actually think it's kind of an interesting pathway. I had been in the health and fitness world for many, many years, of, over three decades. But several years ago, um, I had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition that affects the thyroid when I was pregnant with my fourth daughter. So I have four daughters and um, they keep me busy. But it's two, it's, and during that journey, I knew I wanted to take a holistic integrated approach. So I did start to go on some levothyroxine, some thyroid medication at the time, because I was told that that was absolutely critical when I was pregnant for the health of the baby. Um, but I also simultaneously sought out the help and guidance from a naturopath and started looking at different things, you know, actually doing stool tests and, and looking at different nutrient values and things like that. So it really piqued my interest to know there's more to the story here than just simply take a medication because, you know, I had been given this diagnosis and was told that this would be, a, you know, an autoimmune condition that I would have for life and would be on medication for the rest of my life. And um, then a few years after that, about two years after that, my oldest daughter, who had always been, she's a highly sensitive and, and, and um, um, just, you know, can kind of pick up empath, empathetic, can pick up, you know, emotions from her environment around her and everything. Um, she was experiencing such extreme anxiety at age eight that she started to have seizures. In fact, she got to the point of where it was so severe. She was having between 10 and 15 seizures in a day. Wow. And Chantel, when I tell you there's nothing more stressful than seeing your child struggle and, um, oh gosh, I'll, I'll never forget the day being at Lurie Children's Hospital down in downtown Chicago and the pedi pediatric neurologist came in and was telling my husband and I that, you know, she is, she has these seizures. She will likely be on medication for life. Um, it got to the point where it was so frequent and so many that she was taking four different benzodiazepine medications to try and control the seizure activity, 12 pills a day as an eight-year-old. And I mean, she, she had always, she's always like highly relational and intelligent and, and witty and smart and like charismatic. And just seeing my baby girl, like on this medication, she was a completely different individual. She was like out of it and like malaise and it was heart wrenching and every fiber in my being knew that like, this can't be the, this can't be the, her future. Um, something, and, you know, they, of course, nothing against, you know, the 
um, medical practitioners were fabulous that we were working with highly trained, really skilled individuals. They had run all of the tests and there was no discernible reason. There was no tumor. There was no damage. There was no discernible reason in her brain neurologically for why she was having these seizures. And we were told that sometimes these things can be hereditary and it's just the way it is. You just have to manage it. And something within me just knew like, no, that's, that's not the answer. Like there has to be more to understand the root cause of why, why was her body starting to have this imbalance hormonally, which affected her neurotransmitters and what could we do to help create a shift? Um, so that was really the catapult. That was my journey. I feel like it was a divine redirection, you know, mm. to put me in the, in the space of functional medicine science. And that's when I went back to school and essentially had a master's level degree of study in functional medicine science. And at the time we worked with other practitioners for my daughter's benefit as well. And the great news is um, when within nine months, she made some pretty significant changes, right? Some dietary changes, some lifestyle changes, really um, getting more tools and how to navigate and manage stress. And she was able to wean off of all of her medication in nine months, which was completely unheard of. And she's been episode free, seizure free ever since. Um, In fact, actually, it was kind of ironic that we're talking this now because this summer, she's going to be a senior in high school um, next year. And this summer, we she really her dream is to go into the U.S. Air Force Academy. And um, one of the requirements, you have to go through a very thorough physical review and and analysis. And one of the things is you can't have a history of seizure activity, which she obviously does, unless you have had a sleep deprived EEG and a completely normal sign off from a neurological evaluation. So we went this summer about a month ago and she did that sleep deprived EEG. And and this was a new doctor who didn't hadn't seen her before, but was looking at her history. And he was, he kept saying, he's like, now, can you explain? He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. She was on four different medications and she was having this level of activity. And we said, yes, at age eight and, and eight, nine. And he's like, and how, how did she, you know, it was, it was funny. You could tell that's just not standard. Like her, her trajectory was very atypical. And um, the good news is he did say, he's like, well, her EEG is completely normal. And I sign off, you know, she's eligible for active duty. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's amazing is I know, I've lived it. The human body has amazing resilient capability. And when given the right environment and the right information, your body can completely transform its health. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And did you ever find a root cause that triggered it or was it an accumulation of different things? It was accumulation of different things. For her, in her case, it was really um, some difficulty with detoxification of hormone levels, right? So adrenaline and neopinephrine and cortisol, which then would trigger heightened activity of neurotransmitter activity in the brain. So once we had, and and again, really using, that's why I'm so um, passionate about helping people to understand what's happening biochemically in their body and how to help process. And, you know, if if we, a lot, and so again, and I actually learned a lot for myself with my Hashimoto's and how to put that into remission, because a lot of it is detoxification of stress hormones, Mm. right? How the body is handling and processing stress how it's able to process. And like, we're going to talk about Hashimoto's and the connection with estrogen dominance and how, again, you have to have the right nutrients in order for your body to be able to process those, um, those hormones and and not not create um, a blockage. Yeah. And I've actually also met a lot of women who don't only have Hashimoto's, but then it's in combination with other things. So they might have food sensitivities or even more than sensitivities. They might have like celiac or they yes. might have, you know, other issues that come together. So they are highly interrelated with other autoimmune disease sometimes. And mm-hmm. um, it's, it's a very fascinating thing. And I think in, uh, in our health industry, one thing that gets lost in translation sometimes is that how complex the body is. Sometimes we can't just give a one answer for every person. You know, I mean, I'm, I see that with diet, like, especially because I'm in nutrition, um, I, I love my plant-based diet. I really do. But I do I, I do also acknowledge that, you know, I can eat raw kale because I don't have thyroid issues, for example. But another mm-hmm. person with thyroid issues having raw cruciferous vegetable would be so deterrent to them and could mm-hmm. be harmful to already existing conditions that they have. So 
it's really, really important to understand the individual. And I think, you know, for us that have experienced health issues on our own, that's that empathy comes with the um, the experience of it instead of being just uh, ticking boxes of this is a disease and this is a solution. I mean, we do it in different ways because we are holistic as well. But of course, doctors learn the same. This is the, the pathology and this is the, the drug you give for the pathology to manage the pathology. So it's not even about healing. So I think whether in, even in the holistic world, and I want to say it because I think a lot of people think, you know, that we we think that we have the solution for everything. But even in our world of holistic therapy, sometimes we practitioners forget that is not one thing that can fix it all. And it's not one solution for everyone. Do you agree? Absolutely. Chantelle, you you nailed it because that's exactly right. Everyone's everyone's body is made up of so many different factors and, you know, complex different things that influence our biochemistry, our um, environment, so many different factors with foods, with, you know, even how we perceive our world, that you absolutely have to take a unique approach to health management. And that's why I actually look, I actually think of, so we, you know, our, our, our business, we work with women across the country, all over the place. And one of the things that's so fabulous about it is really about personal empowerment, Like I truly believe our health journey for many women is a chance to step into greater appreciation, understanding and awareness of self, because it is you no longer is it the model where I, you know, turn over my health future to a specialist or to a, a, you know, a doctor or even a holistic practitioner, whoever that is, I feel like you absolutely get to be an active partner in the journey because no one is living in your body and no one knows your body as well as you do. Right. So it's, that's why it's so critical to really have it look at as a collaborative partnership. Yeah. I love that. And it really involves the patients, which um, is so important because I think we sometimes feel isolated and we're powerless in front of a white coat that tells us you have this and there's nothing I can do about it. Oh, well, they would never say I can't do about it. There's nothing to do about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's it makes you feel like, well, wait. And then a lot of people fall for it because, I mean, studying takes time, uh, self-confidence yeah. as well, because we always put in a position where we are told we're not really doctors. We're not doctors. So if you're not a mm-hmm. doctor, you can't understand the literature. And that's not true because you can read anything if you actually know how to read Um mm-hmm. Sure, the jargon is a little bit different in medical uh, language, or just like it would be in, uh, in you know, in the legal um, environment. Although I think legal is way worse than medicine, <laughs> the medical <laughs> jargon. But uh, yeah, we have to just really adapt to um, understand and take take control. So I like that partnership. Okay, well, let's dive into the thyroid. Uh, okay, a lot of people obviously know about the thyroid, but let's just uh, talk about what the thyroid is and does as a standard. And then we can go into hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, which are uh, linked but different actually. Um, because Hashimoto is an autoimmune, uh, hypothyroidism can also be not autoimmune. So um, yeah, let's go into it. Yes. So thyroid, right? Thyroid is that small little butterfly shaped gland that's located in the kind of the middle of the throat region. And it is responsible for producing thyroid hormone. Ironically, though, which which I always think is an insightful to point out is that at least in many um, conventional traditional uh, medical lab lab testing opportunities, they will check something called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which actually isn't an indication of the amount of thyroid hormone that your gland is producing. It's a measure of what's being released from the pituitary gland in the brain to signal to the thyroid to release. It's thyroid stimulating hormone, right? It's signaling to the thyroid to create and release thyroid hormone. But our thyroid gland produces T4 and a little bit of T3, predominantly T4, which is the less active form, the inactive form of thyroid hormone. And then that once it's released from the gland and circulated around the body, T4 goes into the liver and the liver is such a critical organ when it comes to thyroid health, because so many different parts happen in the liver is where predominantly the T4 inactive form of thyroid is converted into T3. And then once T3 has been converted and activated, that's what circulates around and really gets, um, put into the cell receptors 
to essentially help regulate. Think of think of thyroid hormone as like the body's regulator, right? It it, it helps to regulate temperature. It helps to regulate um, activity and just essentially all. It's it literally affects everything. When we say this, the saying is sluggish thyroid, sluggish everything. So mm-hmm. even in terms of digestive processes will slow down. In terms of our ability to feel energy, well, that'll slow down. In terms of our ability to grow hair, like everything can slow down because everything is impacted by the abundance or lack of thyroid act- activation. Mm-hmm. So thyroid is a very important regulator in the body. It affects metabolism. And like I said, it affects digestion It affects absorption It affects ATP production. It's really critical. And actually, unfortunately, there is a high degree of undiagnosed suboptimal thyroid function in both men and women. And that is oftentimes we see that suboptimal thyroid function being a precursor to many, many different forms of chronic disease. So everything across the board from cardiovascular disease to cancers, to Alzheimer's, any sort of degenerative disease, usually you can see some evidence of suboptimal thyroid function. If you were to look at a full thyroid panel, you know, anywhere from five to 10 to 15 years predating the actual awareness or the incidence of the the chronic disease state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, you said a lot of uh, we, a lot of doctors, a lot of labs would check for the TS, but um, the, the, they don't check for the T4 or, or like at all. And so they, they see the signaling is there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the thyroid is actually producing enough of the hormone or even checking if the liver is converting. Right? I was just going to say, so a lot of times, because even if we have like, right, the pituitary is stimulating the thyroid gland, let's say the thyroid gland is then producing some T4 and a little bit of T3 hormone. But if it's not being able to be converted effectively in the liver, so you're not getting an adequate level of T3, or the cell receptors are damaged or blocked or sometimes somehow resistant So they're not actually, once the T3 is even converted in the liver, it's not able to activate at each individual cell. There's so many different steps Mm -hmm. that go way beyond just the TSH that if we stop and just look at TSH, we don't necessarily know an an accurate indication of what is the cellular effect within the whole body. Yeah, absolutely. And I've experienced, I I did a full panel last year just to check because it hasn't hasn't been, hasn't been done in years. And I Mm -hmm. went private, um, but they were like, you were, you want to check everything? I'm like, yeah, you have to check everything. <laughs> like, of course. Yeah. Um, so that, that was an interesting answer. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me now. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, obviously the, the, the thyroid is supposed to work perfectly that way, creating those hormones, the conversion is meant to happen and everything is fine. When do things go wrong? And now I want to just mention, can we can, if we can, um, the... Um, hyper hypo and hyper difference because there are mm. also people that have hyper thyroidism but yes. although more people have hypo it seems uh can we just make that distinguish distinguishment between the two yes absolutely so hyper is what you would expect where it's actually higher level so when we have people have hyper thyroid activity um that can be like palp- heart palpitations excessive heat where you find yourself sweating a lot oftentimes it's people who have a difficulty putting on weight or keeping weight because the metabolism is just like cranked up. So, well, for some women, they're like, Oh, I wish I was hyper, right. That'd be a a good problem to have is to be warm and to have, you know, releasing weight, but that can be stressful on the body. That is actually putting, it's almost like turning your car on and driving at 80 miles an hour all the time. That's going to run up the parts much more quickly. So hyper is not a, is not benefit, is not desirable. And hypo is the opposite. So hypo would be slow where things are not working optimally, where they're um, less intensity than is desirable to regulate the body. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned the relationship between detoxifying the body from hormones. Um, Mm -hmm. Does that apply to hypothyroidism as a standalone or is it particularly specific to things like Hashimoto's? It actually applies across the board. So, um, well, and again, when I say across the board, there are many different circumstances and obviously knowing the individual circumstances is going to be important. So sometimes it's a matter of um, lack of key nutrients, but especially when it comes to detoxification, what I see as a common, common dynamic for women, especially 
through their 40s into their 50s premenopausal. Um, I'll explain a little bit. So typically, and there's there's always an interplay between mm-hmm. our thyroid hormone and other hormones in the body, right? It's cortisol in particular. Cortisol is a priming hormone that you need some base levels of cortisol to even prime the receptors to take in thyroid hormones. So if we have flatline cortisol and our adrenals are not able to produce adequate levels, that's going to affect your thyroid health. Yeah. Or conversely, let's say progesterone typically starts to decline in women five to 10 years before menopause even. So relatively speaking, progesterone levels may be really, really low, which means estrogen by comparison is dominant, right? It's higher levels of estrogen. And when the body has higher levels of circulating estrogen over and over and over for a period of you know months or even years at a time, this has a significant impact on thyroid health because estrogen can, can block the prolactic enzyme activity of some key enzymes that are necessary for something called glucuronidation, which helps to excrete estrogen out of the body. So if we have, it's almost like it becomes this, um, the cycle where estrogen blocks thyroid hormone from being released from the gland sometimes. And then if we don't have adequate estrogen detoxification from the liver, then the estrogen kind of keeps piling up and piling up, which is going to keep kind of blocking the thyroid hormone. Okay, so now we talked about hypothyroidism. So we're going to go down a branch of Hashimoto's. So what is Hashimoto's? Um, Well, you mentioned it's autoimmune, but uh, what it is exactly what does it do? Yes, great question. So Hashimoto's is when there is a, when a detectable amount of what's called thyroid peroxidase antibodies. So TPO antibodies, typically they'll test it. TPO will be, you know, what you would see on a lab marker. And when those, the, when those antibodies have been elevated, what that is signaling is that the immune system has gotten involved. The immune system says, whoa, we see there, there's some, there's some inflammation happening around the thyroid gland. We need to come over and start to get involved and, and have a response, right? Immune system. So it's interesting because a lot of, we always think of inflammation as a bad thing. Inflammation is a bad thing. Really the in- inflammation is just a, a signal that the immune system has been primed to be turned on. Mm-hmm. So when we see inflammation around the thyroid gland, what that's saying is that the immune system is sensing, Hey, there's a problem here. I need to mount a response, right? Well, why would it be mounting a response? Again, because I talk about often, not always, but oftentimes, either through food sensitivities and or estrogen dominance, there is some blockage happening. And so the gland itself is starting to um, become blocked and inflamed and swollen. So that's what's going to signal this TPO elevation. And so what do we need to do? We need to look at what is the root cause again, what is causing that, that blockage or that dysfunction in that process in that flow of thyroid hormone. And then again, looking at the liver health to see is conversion happening from T4 to T3 is the rest of the hormone balance supporting optimal functioning across all systems. Yeah. So what are are the, you mentioned the tests to do for Hashimoto's. What are Mm -hmm. the first, what is the protocol for you when someone comes to you with Hashimoto's being diagnosed with Hashimoto's and they, you know, they, they say, well, I'm struggling. I put on weight. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of uh, abdominal fat, which a lot of women actually never had before. They were slim. And then all of a sudden they find that they are just piling up weight. So there is definitely estrogen dominance there as well. And they just don't know what to do because whatever they do, it doesn't work. And they've been just told that's the medication you have to take for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's so, that's so disheartening, right? Cause it's like, this is this, there has to be another, another pathway, another thing that I can look at. So one of the key things we start to look at is nutrition, right? Mm-hmm. Really getting clear on what is and, and calming the nervous or calming the immune system down, because when we can get the immune system calmed down and 90% of the immune system is located in the gut. Mm-hmm. So that is the most high impact place to start is with gut health. Because if we can calm down the immune system and we can simultaneously get in some key nutrients that perhaps are not in abundant enough quantities that the liver can do its job and that, you know, all the other parts can start to have the fuel that they need, then that's going to be the first place we start. So usually it's, it's having a, you know, having an open, honest conversation about like, let's take a look at, you know, what does your food look like these days? What's working and what's not. And and I, you know, I personally don't, I, I'm similar to you, Chantel. I don't take the approach of like, 
Hashimoto's, that means you automatically have to eat this way. Mm. That may or may or may not be the case. We have to look at the individual, look at the circumstances. And, and honestly, I take approach of like, the most important thing is the thing that you're going, it's going to require some change. We know that period, because if there's no change, the current pattern is what got us to where we are today. So mm. we know that there's going to have to be some change and some support through that change. However, it's not I don't think it's wise or even beneficial to take a very, very aggressive, overwhelming, like elimination of so many things and, um, you know, change so many things in a person's diet all at once, because that likely will not be sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to do step by step, because again, I think of overwhelm as a toxin. There is such an emotional component to thyroid health in particular Mm -hmm. and stress. So if we try and create a shift, but do it too fast, too soon, or in such such a dramatic way, we're just simply creating more overwhelm, which is going to be more toxins in the body, right? So it's, it's really about partnering together to see what is going to be like, what's okay, what's that first step? And let's, let's kind of stretch a little bit and say, okay, what needs to happen? And then what's the next step that makes the most sense given your situation and, and your current, um, you know, nutrition and diet and lifestyle. Yeah. And then uh, what are, what are, what else are you looking at? What are the other like um, ailments that the person might have? Are you looking at to make sure that there are not parallel pathologies going on? At gut health, right? Looking okay. at gut health, looking at, um, honestly, a lot of it is looking at the mental, emotional health and stability okay. because that there's, there's a lot of anxiety tends to go very, um, again, pretty common hand in hand with, especially with estrogen dominance and suboptimal thyroid function, whether it be Hashimoto's or um, suboptimal function in another way, because neurotransmitter activity is so correlated. And we think of, we look at that whole HPATG access, right? So the hypothalamus, the pituitary are located in the brain. They signal to the adrenals and the thyroid and then the gonads, but essentially all of those hormones are that whole symphony of access is interconnected. Mm -hmm. So looking at giving people tools and resources, so really getting a sense of like, what is that? What is the stress response? What does the cortisol curve look like? What is, how is the body handling and adapting your daily, daily life? That's going to be so critical too. What is the trend that you see the most when it comes to uh, women with Hashimoto's? Do you feel like they have a, a lower resistance or intolerance, I should say, to stress. So higher cortisol level, what is the curve looking like for them? Yeah, I would say usually it's one of two things, either heightened, well, and actually the, so the response in the body tends to look similar with cortisol, but it's either heightened food sensitivities or some type of gut component that they are unaware of. And maybe it's been festering and going on for a period of years or stress. It's it's really like the dynamics of um, either the, the, the type of, and this is my situation. So I'll give you a prime example. I was somebody who had been in the health and fitness world for a long time. And I had this mentality that it's not a hard workout until you've been sweating like a puddle for two hours a day. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was very much into teaching group fitness classes and kickboxing and whatnot. And I ate my salads and I thought I'm super healthy. How in the world do I have an autoimmune condition? Right. So that type of dynamic of just a, um, a very extreme understanding or belief about what quote unquote is necessary to be healthy Mm. can drive the body just depleted. Yeah. You mentioned the adrenals. So when we talked about how the thyroid functions, there's a very high correlation between the thyroid hormones and liver and the adrenal glands. Can we just very quickly talk about adrenal glands? Because a lot of people don't even know what they are. Yes. Okay. So the adrenal glands are okay, located in, in the back above your kidneys and they're responsible for producing. And actually it's funny because a lot of people don't realize. So when we think of um, cortisone, corticosteroids, your adrenals produce different types of hormones, neopinephrine, mm-hmm. epinephrine. But when we think of like, if somebody has pain, oftentimes they'll go to get a cortisone shot. Well, essentially that's because the body's adrenal glands are not able to produce adequate amounts of this cortisol actually in cortisone is a deactivated form to create some, some, um, sense of relief. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, and a lot of times it's again, going back to some important nutrients that are necessary. 
that is the number one takeaway. If, if, if that's the biggest learning lesson I always want to empower people with, we tend to, as our society, we tend to think of food as, um, you know, something that is enjoyable, something that we do in social gatherings. Some, for a lot of people, food is kind of just a an afterthought. It's there. It's something that's just part of life. And, and we don't necessarily give much prioritization to the content and the nutrient density of the foods that we consume. But there's one thing that I say over and over and over, your body is like a car. Like in some ways and shape, it needs to have constant fuel all the time. Every day, we need to be fueling it with so many nutrients just in order for get to get all these systems to work effectively. So, you know, I invite people to look at it as like, think of it as part of your job is to fuel your body appropriately. Mm. So many times we just have suboptimal nutrient levels. So it's no wonder that the systems can't work the way that they're designed to. Yeah. And you mentioned um, detoxification being really important. And we talked about detoxifying from byproducts of hormones or hormones themselves after they've done their job. What mm -hmm. about heavy metals? Yes, that's a whole nother component as well. Absolutely. So there and there's there's different um, testing that you can do to get a sense of somebody an individual's exposure to heavy metals, because that is a key component. If If somebody has elevated levels of mercury or lead or, you know, different metals that can stay trapped in the body. Again, that's going to create dysfunction and a blockage in the way that the systems work together. So it is important that that's definitely another dynamic and another area to explore, especially I, I will say I don't typically start there because there's so much you can do first with adding in key nutrients with looking at gut health overall. But it's if you're if you're making some steps, and you've been making changes, and you don't see the progress that you would expect, then it's like, well, maybe there's something else that's getting in the way. And that's when we typically look at heavy metals. Mm, yeah, that's what makes a lot of sense. What mm. about now nutrients, you mentioned you're looking at nutrients, what are the nutrients that you most find that are depleted in the body with somebody that has Hashimoto's? Oh gosh, a lot of amino acids. So again, when we talk about liver detoxification, there's phase one, phase two detoxification has sulfation, glucuronidation. There's a couple of key processes that are dependent upon amino acids. So, and I see this more common with women, to be honest, but like, for example, glycine, um, cysteine, and we need to have, again, so cysteine, glycine can be found in uh, some different forms of, um, you know, plant sources, your, your beans and your lentils are great sources of glycine. Um, cysteine, taurine is a, is an important amino acid, but it only comes from animal sources. So you have to have adequate levels of cysteine in order to create taurine if you're just using it from plant sources. So again, it's the abundance, it's the frequency of having things like nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, like the volume of it is substantial. And a lot of times I think, I think women, cause I think we're a, a lot of people are still under the impression that if I'm gaining weight, I should be eating less. Mm. So they often try and cut calories and cut out things. And usually it's uh, surprising them that you actually, you're, you're undernourished. Mm. Your body can't work the way it's designed to, because it doesn't have enough of the key nutrients that, that is necessary. Yeah. That makes sense? It makes sense. We are, it makes a lot of sense. Um, be, well, because, you know, the, the message is we're eating too much mm -hmm. and we are eating too much, but of the wrong things. Yes. And so if you have a lot of, if you have whole foods, you can have a bounty full of it. It will be probably half of the calories you will get from the junk that people normally yes. eat and you would eat more, feel more satisfied. So, you know, um, it would be just a very different experience instead of this restriction, restriction, restriction that then ends up being or feeling very uh, re like stressful for the body. And then, as you say, it creates um, a lot of uh, depletion in the body. Okay, mm -hmm. so amino acids make sense. What else? B, vit B vitamins, B12 mm -hmm. in particular. So B12, right, is something that is really important for, again, more of the phase one of liver detoxification, but it's also activation of intrinsic factor in the gut. And B12 does primarily come from um, 
from animal sources. So if, if a person is vegetarian or vegan, they have to be very intentional about where they're getting that and supplementing or from different algae sources to get adequate amounts. Again, it's the volume that's going to be important. Or, or you can sometimes you can obviously supplement with B12 methyl donors and methylated B12 and things like that too to help as well. That's an interesting one. And do you see that deficiency only in uh, say vegetarians or vegans? Or do you also see no, it? No, I do see it across the board. And actually part mm. of the reason that sometimes people even who eat foods that you would think would contain adequate amounts, if they have suboptimal stomach acid levels. So mm. this is another thing we do with all of our clients is to test stomach acid levels because that is very common. If again, sluggish thyroid, sluggish everything, which means even secretion is going to be less than ideal. So secretion of stomach acid, I always find people always find this fascinating because um, oftentimes I have clients that have been told to use um, antacids or proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor medication for their believed to be acid reflux thinking they have too much stomach acid. In many cases, it's usually the opposite that they have suboptimal levels of stomach acid. So that low level of stomach acid isn't appropriately signaling to the pyloric sphincter and the esophageal sphincter to close. So they're sensing that uncomfortable, you know, feeling is essentially perhaps stomach acid that's kind of bubbled up and gotten into the wrong space. But that's just simply because they don't have adequate levels. And the sphincter hasn't closed to keep it compartmentalized appropriately. So that is a really important thing. And we need some stomach acid to activate intrinsic factor and, and help with B12 absorption. So it's not necessarily the case that another thing that affects stomach acid is just the state of mind going back to the stress and how we're living our daily life. The presence, the state of mind, the awareness, the consciousness when consuming food right? That's so important to just be present and be here now, slow down, relax, chew thoroughly. All of these things make such a huge incremental change. So it's so funny because it's like sometimes we're talking about the foundations, the basics, but they can make a night and day difference in terms of did those nutrients actually have any chance of getting into your cells to be usable? Or did we even put it in the mouth, but then it, it couldn't, it couldn't have a positive impact because it couldn't be broken down appropriately. Oh yeah, you nailed it. And um, actually fun, a fun fact is that a lot of doctors uh, prescribe these antacid uh, medication to their patients, but nobody talks about how hydrochloric acid actually decreases with age as well. So mm -hmm. giving, hydro, uh, giving those antacid um, medication to women that are in their 40s, 50s, it's more deterrent than anything because they already don't make enough of the hydrochloric acid to break down even the amino acids, which is possibly why they don't even manage to actually have them in their body for utilization because, you know, their yes. food is just not processed properly from the stomach onwards. Um, so I always found it fascinating because obviously there is this very uh, big message of, you know, as you get older, and of course, this is more talking about seniors, like 70s, 80s, but you need more protein. But it's also the fact that, I don't know if it's more protein, because from the literature I'm reading, it's just, it's not about more protein per se, because the fact that if you can't break it down, then yeah. that's the problem, right? So it's about actually, how do you make sure that your hydrochloric acid stays in a way that it works well. Was one thing is actually not having processed foods because that damages everything. I mean, you're already we lose um, production by a half every ten years. So from twenty five on, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's declining. I um, know, right? You know, so it's just fascinating. But um, that, yeah, you made a very good point there, and uh, that's actually something I see with a lot of my clients when it comes to any problems that they have with a uh, stomach reflux, thinking I have too much, I have too much acidity in my stomach and it's not the case, but then go and actually see what, what they're having is a lot, a lot of acid food. And um, okay. they, that is very, very hard to break down too much animal products. So, you know, I, I as I said at the beginning, I'm plant-based, but I mean, I, I have some clients that are not, and although mm -hmm. I steer them towards their lifestyle, I do appreciate that they still might want to eat some animals and I can't force them not to. Mm -hmm. What I do is that let's look at the quality and, uh, and the quantity, because that's really important. Like, even if you don't want to be a hundred percent plant-based, like you should eat 
you should consider however that the best diet is plant-based as in uh, most of your bulk of food comes from that and then you can yes. add the there is like we always see in our plates as it's the meat first and then vegetables like the garnish <laughs> you know if you yes. have some parsley on your plate it's like oh this is your veg today <laughs> yes no and I, I you uh, absolutely affirm that Chantal I always think about telling my clients it's you want you know three quarters of your plates to be the vegetables to be like the whole grain you know mostly prim primarily brightly colored foods, a variety of different things, and then a little bit of the other stuff, which, you know, some animal protein, if, if that's what you desire and or um, fats, healthy fats as well are important too. Actually, let's talk about healthy fats uh, and uh, Hashimoto's with the aging um we well, no, I don't want to say aging because but you know as women get over 40 um so we yeah. obviously as we get over 40 our hormones are changing too so what mm. is the best uh fat sources that we can add and does it impact the the thyroid gland yes absolutely so again going back to healthy fats always looking at healthy omega-3 fats in particular in majority of um, cuisines around the world, there is omega-6 and omega-3. People tend to have more omega-6. You do need that as well. We tend to have more naturally omega-6 than omega-3 for a lot of different, um, you know, uh, cuisine and culture types of, of foods that they eat. But both are important and especially important to think about the integrity of the cell membrane. Because again, going back to all the different steps that need to happen, right? For thyroid health in particular, not only does the T4 need to be converted into T3, now the T3 needs to be circulated around the body to each cell and get into that cell receptor to signal to the cell. Well, the outer membrane of each and every cell in the body is comprised of lipids, mm -hmm. is comprised of cholesterol and fat. And oftentimes that membrane be can become rancid and damaged. And think of it like, I think of it like a hard crusty shell as opposed to a nice pliable um, flexible fluid outer shell. And in order for us to have adequate hormone signaling, we need to have really integral cell membranes. So these fatty acids are, are vitally important with helping to create optimal signaling with all hormones in the body, not just thyroid hormone, but all hormones. So yes, looking at things like salmon, avocados, walnuts, things that contain flaxseed, chia seed, things that contain high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. Those are great things to be intentional because a lot of times we think about, oh, these are some things that I may eat once or twice a week. Again, these are something that should be part of your diet every day. It needs to mm. be a staple part of the, the, the frequency that you're consuming it. Yeah, at least your your seeds for sure, um, because they also provide amazing fiber. And, mm -hmm. and I know people are concerned when it comes to things like salmon, um, you know, people are concerned with the heavy metals, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. so of course we don't want people to have that every day if they are eating, uh, animal products, but, um, it's, uh, it, it's very fascinating how you said, like we, you know, occasionally we eat something and then we say, yeah, we, we definitely eat that. Like it's part of my diet, but yeah. actually something that is part of your diet at therapeutic range should be every day, like a supplement, yes. right? Yes. Like about a supplement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's really interesting. And this is, I think it raises, you just raised a really important question, Chantal, because of course I will always, I will always encourage people to think of food first because food has so many different phytonutrients and combinations and such, such an abundance of synergistic components that you just can't necessarily replicate in the same way from supplements. However, having said that it's another important consideration for the individual is to have that discussion about Okay, let's be honest with ourselves. We can we can definitely make strides and make improvements to be making changes over time. But what is, like if we're talking about avocados and walnuts, for example, like what is what? How often are you actually getting that in on a seven day typical week, right? Mm -hmm. And then that can help us to gauge well what what would need to be filled in, perhaps through supplementation, if it's just not happening naturally in the diet through food. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what are the supplements you think are the best to have around? I mean, I know it, it depends on the person, but generally speaking, um, what are the supplements? I mean, we said B12 because obviously even people yeah, that, B, you know, yeah. So B vitamins in general, and I typically like having a 
complex. So it has a variety of B vitamins because there are, there are several of them that are important to support detoxification again, fatty acids. So looking at, a, a, for many, for many people that can be a beneficial um, addition just because the, the frequency of which they're consuming it regularly is um, not hitting the mark. Magnesium is actually another really important supplement for it's, it's, it's responsible for impacting over 300 chemical reactions in the body. And magnesium mm -hmm. is critical for even for cellular ATP production for um, so many different steps. And that again, so looking at the different form, you know, there's, there's magnesium taurine, which can be really calming to help with neurotransmitter activity. There's magnesium glycinate, there's different forms of magnesium. So depending on the individual, um, you know, I would customize, which is going to be most advantageous. Some of them can help with, if we have constipation, which can sometimes go in hand with suboptimal thyroid function, some forms of magnesium can have more of a bowel effect and other ones have less so. So, um, but magnesium in general can be a very beneficial supplement for many people as well. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I, I love magnesium. I think actually most of us are really deficient anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. as women it's uh because it's also supporting our uh, hormonal balance so it's really really mm -hmm. important to have magnesium um i i definitely i i myself had to start taking it because yeah although i eat too many foods that contain it i was just not getting enough mm -hmm. and it's fascinating brilliant so when so this is the protocol uh for so you're looking at nutrition you're looking at um the um supplementation if needed what about lifestyle? I was just going to say, we haven't talked about sleep. Yeah. <laughs> sleep is a critical, a critical healing component as well. Um, again, the, the body needs to have that restorative time. So oftentimes this is conversations like let's, let's be honest and let's look at what is, what is the winding down routine before going to bed? Well, how many hours are you actually getting sleep? Not necessarily. And that may be different than how many hours are you in bed how many hours is your body actually sleeping can be a very different story than I laid down at 10 o'clock at night, but I twisted and turned and didn't really fall asleep until 11, 15. And then I was up again at two tossing and you know what I mean? So, so really helping people. And sometimes, again, sometimes it's some, um, interventions with regards to changing up the routine to have the body be in a calming state to really be able to wind down. Sometimes it does benefit women to have some supplemental support with different different elements and again melatonin is what people tend to think of right away melatonin may or may not be the best um, supplemental support to help bolster quality restorative sleep for some people it's it's different functionality than just inadequate melatonin levels but sleep is absolutely critical for the body so really, and, and sometimes it's a matter of like, hey, I just need to make sure my room is cooler and dark so that I have less interruptions in my in my home life. So it's really that conversation about what would need to happen in order to support you getting more consistent, sustainable sleep night after night. Yeah. And actually mentioning melatonin, melatonin like people want to take that as a solution, but just taking magnesium and tryptophan can make a huge difference. And, yes. um, you know, as stimulating uh, or GABA, uh, yeah, GABA can be also something like that. We just have to really understand what are we, what are we lacking that our melatonin is just not producing well enough. And mm -hmm. of course, it could be the sleep hygiene that could be the problem. Um, sure. The room hygiene, as you say, like the prep, the prep of um, of your your scene for it. And I think now that everybody has technology everywhere, that does definitely make sleep a lot more challenging yes. because these blue lights are so stimulating at night. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, it interrupts everything. And there is, there is research that shows the interruption between uh, with the blue light of our hormones. So okay. how impactful can blue light affecting generally our hormones impact oh, our huge, thyroid? Especially, yeah, well, especially when we talk about the, the diurnal rhythm of our sex hormones. I mean, mm -hmm. so signaling, signaling with um, ovulation mm -hmm. happens in large part due to that pattern, right? So if there's an interruption in the pattern of light and dark, when the body senses light and dark periods of time, that can absolutely throw off our ovulation and our signaling in the body hormonally, which is going to have, again, a different uh, cascading effect of 
not only the adrenals, also the thyroid and to the pituitary as well. So um, the light and day signals are vitally important. And even to the point of like, well, I'll, I'll vice versa. So it's, it's the blue light at night, right? So really being mindful and, and creating some awareness of how much that this impacts the body, but also the first thing in the morning, I often will tell clients, like, if possible, within the first 10 minutes of you waking up, can you and ideally, it's I mean, through a window can give you some natural light exposure. But ideally, it's even can you get outside? Can you just like, get a couple fresh air, fresh breaths of air and get natural sunlight exposure, because that signaling that light and, and day distinction is going to be very helpful for overall yeah. balance hormones. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, we need our circadian rhythm to be back in tra- on track. Um, okay, so that's sleep. What other lifestyle changes do people need to make, generally speaking? Like I said, stress management. So really being mindful of and, and thinking of we, we do something called like a perceived stress scale. So getting a sense of like, in a typical 24 hour period, honestly, how many minutes, how many hours, how many minutes do you spend in a negative emotional state? So looking at, I call it like the, 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 how many minutes are you below the line versus above the line? Above the line would be like anything from contentment, satisfaction, to joy, to eagerness, to connection, to happy, you know, all of those positive emotions versus everything from irritation, um, frustration, discouragement, despair, like all the way down to grief or, um, you know, disdainment and, and, and it's being honest with ourselves, right. Mm. It's being willing to look at what is actually happening and name it because if we can't name it, we can't change it. Mm. So we have to actually start to look at what is our emotional balance on a, on a day over day experience, because that emotional set point is signaling sig- massively to the hormones in the body. So if we're just not looking at it or we're not willing to name what's actually there, we can start to shift it. So a lot of the work we do is brain change work as well to really help people identify, understand, and then create new stories around circumstances, situations, relationships that perhaps can hold you trapped in a pattern of negativity. Yeah, brilliant. Um, So is it safe to say that Hashimoto's is possibly reversible or he like curable yeah i mean i look at it in terms of um you can definitely impact from a from a testing standpoint you can definitely impact your tpo level you can definitely support thyroid function so essentially you get to the place of where the body is functioning optimally and you don't have to take medications anymore or do you still need some some people do some people don't I personally am not have not been taking medication for a number of years, but some people find a balance where that medication works in the support of them. So I, I don't ever get into the nuance of diagnosing or, you know, prescribing that's not within my scope of work, but it's really up to the individual of like, what is your desired outcome? What is it that you're seeking? Is your, is your goal to not have medication? Is your goal to have a certain quality of life with energy. And that medication is one of the components in in terms of other nutrients and other key foods that help you to get that, then that's a a successful reality too. So it's really about what is important, but absolutely. Do I think it's doable? Have I lived it? Yes, it is doable. Brilliant. That's awesome. Any Mm -hmm. last um, part that I may not be thinking about any other points that we need to think about when we talk about thyroid health or yeah, the other thing that the only other thing that we didn't touch on, and I don't we don't dive too much is um, thinking about external extension or extenuous toxins from our environment. So we didn't talk Mm -hmm. about that. But how much let's do it. That's what you put on your skin. Like I think Mm -hmm. of your skin as a giant mouth. So what you put on your skin has a huge impact as well in all of those processes that we were talking about in the liver with detoxification and just simply overwhelming the immune system as well. Oh, yeah, of course. So what are the best things you suggest for people to to look at when they're looking at their um, house products, skin products? Mm -hmm. So looking at the labels, obviously, there's a environmental working group website that you can look at to test things to see like what type of ingredients may be endocrine disruptors. Another thing that I think of as just like if you were to just start from one step is to remove things with added fragrances, Mm. because fragrances in particular are very potent stimulation in the body, they create a release of 
stress hormones in the body. So even if you were to just do one step and say, I'm going to remove the fragrances from my shampoo and my laundry detergent and my scented candles and stuff like that, that alone can have such a significant impact in terms of taking some of that burden of toxicity off of your plate. Brilliant. And how do you feel about essential oils? I don't know if you ever looked into them in relation mm -hmm. to thyroid, but if you have, what, what is your thoughts? What are the best ones to have around? I mean, I see that you have a little diffuser behind you. So I, know I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. So again, um, and again, I don't want to make a blanket statement here because I think it's going to depend on the person, depend on the circumstances, but essential oils can be beneficial for some people, especially if they really help to create, um, because some scents can have a physiological impact in terms of the emotional state that they help to facilitate and kind of that calming effect in the body. So it definitely can be a tool used for some people, although, although I do always caution people because there's a wide range in quality. So you have to be mindful of where you're sourcing, um, oh, just like essential oil, just like you would for anything. Yeah, br brilliant, brilliant uh, point. Um, what's your favorite essential oil? Uh, Young Living. Oh, the the brand, but what is the fragrance that you like? What which specific? Oh, the, actually, I I like the citrus blend. Okay, so it's a different one. Okay, cool. Different ones than in there. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. the citrusy too. They do give me a little bit of a lot of energy, a lot of stimulation. Mm -hmm. very uplifting. Yeah, very uplifting. So I like them too. And actually, I found that I find them um, that you know when my cycle when my cycle starts, if I massage my legs with um, lemon and just mix it with some almond oil and I just give my legs a massage it really helps with the water retention um mm. so I do love um uh, doing that and um yeah I've been digging a lot into essential oils and uh, where to find good qualities and yes those brands are very good like you know the doTERRA and the young living of the world mm. they are they I do find them I don't know in Europe maybe more a uh, little bit more expensive here so mm. I tend to actually find uh private farms um that grow mm. organically and thankfully that's available in uh we are we are uh, in Portugal so the Iberian region has quite a few of those farms they don't have all the oils because a lot of them are more exotic um mm. but they they do have quite a fair amount especially of things like citrus oils um lavender uh, even tea tree actually which is great and eucalyptus um but then there are some oils that are really uh, that i love for example like a frankincense and a juice you know you have to get it uh imported um i i do like tisseran as a as a brand for for that particular one i think they have a very good um frankincense and mm. um but yeah it, it would be great to have every single plant in one place that can make them all that would, that would be that would be ideal right <laughs> yeah be, i i do love them um there was a nice um oil from young living uh, i think it's called thieves no is it is mm. it, it yeah it's yeah, I like these a lot too. I use that one. Quite yeah, a for clean, it's really good. For, it's an antibacterial and it's really nice to even make. Um, so while everything was happening, I used to make the hand sanitizer with it. So I mm -hmm. bought some uh, hemp alcohol and I just put the the thieves in it and it's such a nice smell like the cinnamon is very strong so yes. yeah i really like that one. Oh, brilliant okay well it's nice to end up with a nice little uh, beautiful smelling i know topic. like i'm thinking about it now <laughs> yeah. <love> it. <laughs> and i believe you have a little gift for the listeners that we are going to link to the um to the to the episode a little freebie do you want to tell them about it yes i do happy to share so i have something um a, a quick little three steps to reduce bloating in five days and i'll share that link with you but um great you know because it's something that we it's common for us to just have a little bit of bloating or discomfort in our abdomen and some simple steps that you can take to feel massively um relieved and better in a few days so I'll fantastic thank you it will be in the show notes so people people can access it and uh that will also have your contact details and your um mm -hmm. website so they can reach out to you and one thing that i um i saw that today as we're recording because the episode will go out the third week of september so as we're mm -hmm. recording today you have a master class a free master class later that has got to do with hashimoto's and uh, hypothyroidism do you do them periodically yep. I do do master classes periodically. Yes. In fact, I, I, that topic will not be coming up, but I do do that topic probably every 
couple of months per okay. se for sure. So that'll be coming up again. You can feel free to check my website, but we do have another um, really exciting event coming up on September 8th, which is the Empowered Living Live. So it's gonna, we're going to be talking about all things health and also talking about mindset, talking about finances, but really helping women to a, a group of, of experts are coming together to talk about all things about women empowerment and living your best life. So that would be oh, that's amazing. Well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. That was so much fun and such great information. Um, not, not, you know, not many places um, explain exactly what Hashimoto's is. And I know people that suffer with this do feel a little bit lonely and a little bit confused mm -hmm. um, because it's frustrating. Your body changes with this and sometimes nobody yes. can give a straight answer. So it's nice to see that there are ways to look at the the issue and that we are really in control of the steps that we take. We're not just stand by, um, you know, we don't have to just stand by and let it happen and feel like we don't belong to our body anymore, especially when as women, we gain weight and we feel uncomfortable. Um, so thank you for everything you shared. That's awesome. My pleasure. It's fun to chat, Chantel. Yeah, I hope to have you back soon. Sounds good. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, Amanda, for coming on. And thank you, everyone, for staying for this episode. I hope you found it really helpful. And if you have any questions about your health, if you're struggling with thyroid issues, get hold of Amanda. All her information is in the show notes, as well as a wonderful little free gift, Three Steps to Decrease Bloating. The document is downloadable from the show notes so that you can access it and really see how you feel. So I hope you liked it. As always, please do share, like, review, help us grow, and I'll see you next week.